replacement army. Maybe then military victory would be possible. These troops were hostages to Lyndon Johnson's ideas and to the North Vietnamese artillery. The North Vietnamese had the initiative at Khe Sanh. They had zigzagged their trenches to within 100 yards of the Marine lines. It was rumored they were burrowing under the base. It was possible they would come in waves, hurling themselves over the barbed wire. The Marines were like decoys, waiting, hoping to tempt the enemy into one last kamikaze-like charge where they could be destroyed. But the North Vietnamese let the Marines sit. The agony at Khe Sanh was the wait. The wait, wearing and frustrating as the daily incoming artillery. never developed the way the Pentagon said it would. There was continuous contact, but never a decisive engagement. The North Vietnamese did make a mistake. They put some 30,000 troops in the hills surrounding Khe Sanh. The United States Air Force dropped the equivalent of five Hiroshima bombs on the hills, inflicting heavy casualties. There he comes again. He's dropping two now, right in those trees. She was. That sounds good to you. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay, tell him, tell him in a mission, record his target request, replot data. The siege of Khe Sanh lasted 77 days. Nowhere else had the two sides kept their forces and hopes in one place for so long. Neither side ever made a major attack. Neither side had a victory. After all his speeches about the eyes of the world being on Khe Sanh, Lyndon Johnson waited for the world to look the other way. And we started to evacuate the whole position. Johnson had decided on a political solution to the war, not a military one. But he couldn't tell that to the Marines. Khe Sanh, like the whole war, left the American military feeling betrayed. They asked, why did we fight so hard to keep this place if we were going to give it up? We left Khe Sanh in much the same way that seven years later, we left Vietnam. We just pulled out. This was the end of the strategy of American military victory. Travis Air Force Base, San Francisco. Now, give your attention for a couple minutes, please. I believe we can answer some questions for all of you. These remarks are primarily directed toward those of you returning from a live fire area and casualty status. Comments pertain to all services, gentlemen. Now, when you left a live fire area, most of you left all or at least a part of your personal gear behind. Submit a claim for all items of personal property which are lost. Please bear in mind, gentlemen, the only way old Uncle Sam can repay you for your personal property which has been lost is for you to submit a claim to the government for reimbursement. Are there any questions on this, gentlemen? Now, those of you who are combat casualties were drawing flight pay, jump pay, combat pay, demolition pay, incentive pay of any kind, gentlemen, this pay will continue for 90 days from the day you were wounded. Now, <clears throat> the tax exemption that you all enjoyed in the live fire area, gentlemen, will continue for so long as you remain in the hospital. So when you start to make out these stateside income taxes, be mighty certain that you take full advantage of all the exemptions you're entitled to. Exemptions are mighty hard to come by in the states, gentlemen, so use what you brought with you. Any questions on this? Now, of course, the $64 question to everybody is, what's the score on convalescent leave? 
Gentlemen, convalescent leave is part of your hospital treatment. It's the one part you don't want to miss. This is a free ride, not chargeable to you in any way. So as soon as you can convince the doctors and the nurses at the station you're going to that you're healthy, you're full of fun and games, you can take care of yourself, you have no problems, you'll be no problem to your dependents, you need no further treatment at this particular time. And last but not least, gentlemen, you have to actually convince this doctor that you can stand the wear and tear of 30 days on the economy. Any questions on convalescent leave? Tonight, I have ordered our aircraft. I'd back up there, back up again. I wouldn't say we're going to, back up. Oh, oh, we are reducing. March 31st, 1968, yeah, Lyndon Johnson reducing. rehearsing a speech, reducing. reading the teleprompter. Not going to, and one thing, you say you've ordered it, and the next day you're going to order it. You get that, Jim? Yeah. Mark it on your outfit over there. Only 26% of the American people supported his Vietnam policy. And some of you are just checking and going, George, you got something? Eugene McCarthy had successfully challenged him, and now Bobby Kennedy was in the race. We are reducing, substantially reducing, the present level of hostilities, and we're doing so unilaterally. Tonight, I have ordered an aircraft to naval vessel. Uh, wait a minute. Tonight, back up. I, I have ordered our aircraft and naval vessels to make no attacks on the land and population of North The Vietnam American dollar was under bombardment. The gold market in a panic. Here, Nobody planned to pay much attention to this broadcast, but it was the most important Johnson ever made. In our decisions, if Renoi is restrained, we will reciprocate or something like that. This is State Department language. Doesn't make sense what I was talking to you about this morning. There was a sting in the tail of this speech, an unexpected passage that changed the course of 1968. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. This was one of the most controversial broadcasts of the 1968 season. It drew awards and protests in equal measure. Here is its key scene. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. What is freedom? Freedom is black power. What is black power? Black power is... Do you know what black power is? No. Well, then you should never use, you never, should never make any statements if you don't know what they mean. I'm sorry, I don't know. All right. Um, how old are you, young man? I am four years old. You're not four, Aaron. Now, you tell me your right age. How old are you? How old are you? I am four years old. Are you sure you're four? Yes. You're going to let me turn you around and tell you you're some other age? You're six years old, Eric. No. I can't hear you, Eric. No! Are you being frightened by me? No! I'm a teacher. I said you're six. I am four years old. All right, then. You stand up for it, then. You shouldn't be weak. You stand up and say it. You ought to scream it in my face if I try to tell you different, right? Yes. Have a seat. Stand up, young man. Are you a Negro, Travis? No. Are you a flunky, Travis? No. What are you? I am black, young bitch. And what else are you? Are you a boy? No. What are you? Oh, man. What kind of man? Black and beautiful man. Well, what kind? Are you an old man or a young man? Young man. Uh, you, young man, you come here. You're a Negro. No. I am your teacher. You are a Negro. No. Suppose I threatened to beat you, what would you say? Aren't you a Negro now? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Suppose I had some money in my pocket. 
Suppose I gave you a dollar to say that you're an a American Negro. This is money now. Money talks. Money talks. This dollar. And if you don't say it, you don't get it. You're an American Negro, aren't you? No. You won't have any money. You know you need money, don't you? Yes. You need money to live, don't you? Yes. All right. All you have to say, Leon, is that you're an American Negro. Aren't you an American Negro? Are you an American Negro? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. You had to think about that a minute, didn't you? Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Grim-faced and silent, a file of angry young Negroes carrying loaded rifles trooped into the state capitol here in Sacramento, bent on invading the state legislature. White America became increasingly disturbed about black militancy. A black man with a gun not only scared whites, but constituted in white minds a clear and present danger. They claim they must carry guns for their own defense against racists. The armed band forced its way past surprised and bewildered state police to stride through the pass gates outside the assembly and right into the chamber during a legislative session. Facing the fierce-looking invaders with their guns, Speaker Pro Tem of the Assembly, Carlos B's first instruction was to the sergeant-at-arms to throw out the television newsman. This kind of black militants, even though these Panthers gave up their guns easily, was intolerable. Across the country, the FBI files. The FBI was genuinely worried that the black movement might be insurrectionary and a threat to the government of the United States. Using the Freedom of Information Act, CBS News has extracted from these files, I responded to the black movement. What the FBI was afraid of is shown in this memorandum from J. Edgar Hoover to his special agent in charge, Boston. Memo to SAC Boston from the director, FBI. Subject, counterintelligence program. Goals, one prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step toward a real Mau Mau in America. The FBI saw one man who might bring all the blacks together. And when he made the following statement, the FBI thought he was calling for an attack on Washington instead of a march on Washington. We're gonna build our shanties right in Washington and live right there. I'm not playing about this thing. I've agonized over it, and I'm trying to save America. And that's what you are trying to do if you will join this movement. We are trying to save this nation. We can't continue to live in a nation every summer going up in flames, every day killing up people in Vietnam like we're killing. We can't continue this way as a nation and survive. And you can believe it if you want to. And some of us are going to have to take the burden of saving the soul of America. J. Edgar Hoover didn't believe America needed to have its soul saved. For that matter, the FBI had trouble distinguishing between nonviolent blacks and militant revolutionaries. To the FBI, the whole movement appeared dangerous, particularly if one man could unify millions of American blacks from the same memo. Two, prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. King could be a very real contender for this position. There's another document we extracted from Martin Luther King's file. It was to the director of the FBI, from the special agent in charge of the FBI's San Francisco office. It is the opinion that any revelation of immorality on the part of these people is not particularly held against them. An example being the fact that it appears quite well known in government circles that Martin Luther King and some of his associates were highly immoral and depraved, but this seemed to be accepted by some segments of society as a way of life. 